My name is Keith Carter. I come from Beaumont, Texas. My social security number is, I'm not going to tell you because I had my identity swiped once. Yeah, just recently. Tried to clean out my bank account. Fools that they were. Well, look, if your goal is to make art, you had better make uncertainty your friend rather than some kind of nemesis because she will always be whispering in your ear. The work that I do is rooted figuratively and literally in the soil of East Texas. I come from the Texas-Louisiana border, which is responsible for this accent you hear. And over the years, I've used folk tales of dog ghosts or bottle trees, black imagination, Hispanic mythology, my own white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background. I've tried to weave together glimpses into what at least I find instructive or eloquent or enduring. I photograph ghosts. Mostly they're my own. Sometimes they belong to others. I still spend long hours in a dark room and I have a wall upon which I have pinned sayings or letters or things people have sent to me or things I've read that help me to stay focused in my work. Things such as we live at the level of our language. Whatever we can articulate, we can imagine, develop, and explore. Ellen Gilchrist said that. Above all, life for a photographer cannot be one of indifference. Robert Frank. The soul always begins a thought with an image. Aristotle. And one of my true favorites by the poet Wallace Stevens. Poetry must almost successfully resist intelligence. Snatch a grace beyond the reach of art, Alexander Pope. Nobody under 40 can believe nearly everything is inherited, Reynolds Price. For years I've played this kind of harmless game. If I ever read the word poetry or the word you know, writing, I just change the word to photograph or photography. The meaning remains the same, but it, it helps me. A small idiosyncrasy, if you will, for over a decade, the narrative exploration of Southern culture was the foundation of my pictures. It was on my mind when I produced the bodies of work found in my books From Uncertain to Blue, The Blue Man, and Mojo. I'm self-taught, you know, for a long time I just was whoever's book I could get my hands on. Many of the books I read in my 20s still haunt me and follow me around today. They influence my work. Books such as Let Us Now Praise Famous Men by James Agee, and of course, photographs by Walker Evans. The House of Breath by William Goyen. The Grapes of Wrath, Steinbeck. Still course through me like blood. They helped me to understand that ordinary lives are not ordinary, and that flashes of heaven can appear as readily is our own reflection in water. It was at the same time, through my friend and mentor, a sculptor in my hometown, David Cargill, that I discovered many of the great artists through his library, an extraordinary library. He would loan me books. The first book he loaned me was Vermeer, and he would say, look, it's almost like a normal lens. Uh, look at the perspective. Look at the use of natural light. Look at the use of gesture. And then he loaned me Henry Cartier-Bresson's A Decisive Moment that just blew my socks off. Beautiful, beautiful book. Still later, I took the bus from Beaumont, Texas to New York City, having written the Museum of Modern Art, saying that I was a, quote, serious scholar of photography, unquote, and could I visit their collection. Well, I stayed two weeks. I'd saved enough money I thought I could make it a month. But I had the best time. I saw all these great prints. I could not have been more excited if I'd held, I don't know, diamonds or gold in my hands. You know, prints by these great people. I saw what they actually looked like for the first time. You know, to me, the fundamental fact that the raw materials of photography are time and light and, to a large extent, memory, are really what make it such a peculiar or strange medium. My photographs have changed over the years. I mean, I'm self-taught. I learned to print by trying to replicate what I saw in books. I use a wide variety of subject matter. Everything, for me, is equal before the lens. I mean, I think photography itself is like the great democratic medium. 
And over the years, I use a wide variety of things. Animals have frequently appeared in my photographs. Birds, dogs, cats, raccoons, deer, turtle, pigs, flies, mice, crabs, alligators, horses, goldfish, lizards, snakes, bears, fireflies, the face of a loved one. They all have equal weight for me. And in the pictures found in the books I did, uh, Heaven of Animals, Bones, and Ezekiel's Horse, that was what was on my mind. I tried to treat all creatures, great and small, with a certain grace, a certain democracy. Sometimes when I'm working, I think of a stanza from a poem by Yeats. Had I the heavens embroidered cloths, inwrought with golden and silver light, the blue, the dim, the dark cloth of night and light and the half light. In the last few years, I felt like I'd gone as far as I was able in the exploration of my roots. So around 1999, 2000, I went abroad and I tried to take my place with me. I tried to make images as I would in more familiar circumstances. Only this time the subject matter was different. I've always liked cliches. I tread the fine line of cliches all the time. And I tried to treat locales such as Venice or Paris the same as I would treat Beaumont, my hometown, or Jasper, a small town near me. I'm older now and I'm a little wiser. My eyesight has changed, my focus has changed, my life has changed. So it is that my pictures have changed. I have little interest in the academic concerns of photography. I have little interest in inflated rhetoric revolving around photography. In my own mind, I try to make pictures that are for me externally objective, but internally boundless. I look for a poetry of, of the ordinary. My issues, such as they are, are archetypal ones. Those of a failed Eden, a hopeful, peaceable kingdom, temptations, falling, redemption, and ultimately resurrection through some kind of grace in our lives. Nowadays, my photographs try to offer up something of a cosmic mythology, which I guess sounds like inflated rhetoric in its own right. But I think of my stories are of children or of potential, innocence, of animals and angels, men and women, earth and stars, everything yoked together as one world. There have been a lot of people who have influenced me. I still love Vermeer the boxes of Joseph Cornell, the French photographer Ajay. His work just devastates me. I love the early 19th century, almost anonymous photography. Did you know that Emerson, after having his daguerreotype made, said, were you ever daguerreotyped, O mortal man? And did you look with all vigor at the lens of the camera to give the picture the full benefit of your expanded and flashing eye. That's a wonderful thing. I believe there's an element of magic in photography, a certain alchemy, if you will. I love what Cartier-Bresson said, your photographs are your intellectual and sensual life. For me, you take light, precious metals, Mysterious chemistry, wield the camera like a magic wand, murmur a few hopeful words, and on a good day, perhaps you can conjure up proof of a dream. Look, you want to get good fast? Read. You want to get even better? Work, work, work. Work harder than anybody who isn't a photographer can possibly imagine. Now, I stole that from E.E. E. Cummings. And despite my accent, let me tell you, I love metaphors, I love music, so I'll give you 
a children's song because the world doesn't need another great, beautiful Joyce Tennyson or Sally Mann or pick your contemporary photographer of choice. What the world needs is you, your voice. And here's the little song. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing high and some sing lower. Some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands or paws or anything they got now. You find your own voice. You know, that's not Merle Haggard, but hey, I'm not quitting my day job. <laughs>